Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast brought to you by Lindenwood University's Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise. Examining market approaches to help solve economic and social issues, Hammond.Institute. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Starting today, the St. Louis Chess Club is hosting a new all-female tournament that aims to encourage women in chess worldwide. The Cairns Cup, named for St. Louis Chess Club co-founder Jean Cairns Sinkfield, signals a new era and step forward for chess. St. Louis Public Radio editor Holly Edgel recently spoke with Jennifer Shahadi, a two-time U.S. women's chess champion and chess commentator and analyst. Holly began by asking Shahadi why this new tournament is so exciting for chess enthusiasts. Well, because it's the first international women's tournament that we're having here in the capital of chess in the United States. So it's really a, a, a chance for the queens of the board to take center stage. And it's also the most strong tournament in the history of U.S. chess with women. That's really neat. I, I was going to ask you, what would be the significance of this tournament in sort of the broader world of chess? I know it's just new, but it seems a big deal. It is. Things are getting better for women in chess all over the world, and I think this is just a sign of good things to come, where women are really respected for not only their chess, but also for their point of view in the world. You know, In order to make chess more popular, we really need to get more women into the game, and people are really starting to realize that. I was uh, noticing that there are over a thousand grandmasters who are men, and maybe about forty grandmasters who are women. Does that sound about right? It sounds similar. Yeah, maybe I think it's more in the thirties, but yes, that's about right. So, do you think it's because women think this is not for me because it's a male-dominated thing? I don't want to bother or try. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them don't have the role models serving countries. Maybe they aren't encouraged as much, including in the United States sometimes. I mean, I've seen parents who, you know, ask me to give lessons to their boys, and I see their girl, the girl looking over the shoulder saying like, hey, I, I want to play. At least it feels like they're saying that. So I still think there's a gap in how we encourage girls and boys, and we need to close it to get more girls interested. Because honestly, I think that Chess can provide even more benefits to girls and boys because it gives you a flow experience where you're not thinking about what other people are thinking of you. And that confidence, that intellectual confidence can you know, spread to all areas of your life. That's a really good point. I wanted to know a point about why, why is it that there are grandmasters and woman grandmasters? What, when did that, do you know how that came about and why that still exists today? Well, I think in the, in the past, there were very few women who took the game seriously compared to now. So they had a women's grandmaster title as a stepping stone to really, you know, show the girls and the women who achieved this title that we were excited for them and celebrate. Um, now things are a little different. And lots of women, as you mentioned, about 40, are earning the grandmaster title, the overall grandmaster title. So while both titles exist, I think that people in the chess world understand that they're different and that the overall title is something in the grasp of any woman who takes the game seriously enough. So set the scene for us a little bit at a chess tournament. Um, there's a, I think there's mystique about chess with a lot of people. It seems like a really tough game, and it is intellectually challenging. What does it look like in a chess tournament of this caliber? Well, if you go to the St. Louis Chess Club, and you should to watch these games, what you're going to see in the tournament hall is a lot of intensity. You're going to get this sense, even if you just hear nothing except a few um, pounding pieces, you're going to get the sense that there's a lot of nervous and excitement energy, right? Like everybody is has so much at stake. It's totally quiet, but really they're playing for their lives. They're like so excited. When you win a game, it's the most joyous experience. And when you lose a game, it almost feels like a mini death. And I th emotionally in the way that your body feels afterwards. Then you're going to go downstairs and check out some of the live commentary. We have um, incredible live commentary from uh, top women chess players in the world. And you can also walk around the Central West End and everywhere you're going to see screens with me, Maurice, and Yaz also taking you through the play-by-play. -play. Yeah, tell us about that. You're going to be co you're not playing. You're, co you're commentating. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like for you as a player when you're watching and sort of commenting instead of playing? It feels great. It's really exciting because I get to not only experience the intrigue of the moves, I guess what's going to happen next. And sometimes they're wrong and sometimes they're right. 
And I also get to show other people what it is that I love about this game and try to break it down, not only into the most accurate moves, but also into the emotions that the players are feeling and the, the variations that might not have showed up in the board, but are sometimes the most beautiful. For instance, somebody might make a move and uh, the player sees all the intricacies of the move, but underneath the move, there's a beautiful queen sacrifice. It never gets played, but that's actually the beauty. So as commentators, our job is to like uncover some of the beautiful things that you don't actually get to see. That's really fascinating. Um, so you're not playing in this tournament. Why? Why did you decide not to play? Right now, I'm not. I'm. I'm not at the level. I mean, this is. I'm a two-time U.S. Women's Champion, but these players are very active, and they're the very best players in the world. So there's only ten of them. It's an extremely elite field, and yeah, it's really exciting to be part of it. I'm also on the also on the organizing side and the commentating side. And I'm very invested also in what this does for girls in chess. I do some work with a U.S. chess, and one of the things I do for them is push forward their women's initiative. And I think that also at the St. Louis Chess Club, it's really important to us to get more girls into the game. And we see that these top 10 players are like role models. So uh, we feel that not only girls, but boys as well are going to be watching these games. And, you know, it's inspiring. And it's inspiring. And is there anything else you want to say about this as a, as a overall statement or anything I, that I haven't asked you that you think people should know about the tournament? Well, I think that the tournament, you can watch it at 1 o'clock um, Central Time on uschesschamps.com or head over to the St. Louis Chess Club. Beautiful neighborhood, Central West End. Your favorite Starbucks is there. There's the World Chess Hall of Fame with great exhibits. And, of course, you can uh, see the commentary. I really encourage you to do that even if you don't play chess, and especially if you have kids, nieces, nephews, it's really just a great way to spend the day. Um, dare I say, a very unusual but smart Valentine's Day date. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> we do have a round on Valentine's Day. That, that would be, that sounds like the perfect date. Exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> that, that guy is a winner. That's right. I mean, I actually witnessed a proposal outside the uh, World Chess Hall of Fame. Oh, gosh. That's oh, awesome. God, it was brilliant. Yes. Oh, let's talk about your book. Okay, sure. You have two books. Yeah, I've written two books, Chess Bitch and Play Like a Girl, and both books aimed to showcase the top women players in history in the world. Chess Bitch, of course, was more of a feminist exploration about how in chess, if you're really aggressive as a female, you're often called the B word as opposed to a man who might just be called aggressive, strong, tough. So I wanted to show how in chess some of the issues are reflected in the real world. And actually, Chess Bitch kind of goes back to the chess queen. As we know, the chess queen is the most powerful piece on the board. But actually, before the rules as they are now were um, you know, codified in 1500, the chess queen was actually the weakest piece on the board. In 1500, along with the rise of queens like Isabella, it became the strongest piece. And I think it's a beautiful metaphor for how when women are involved, the game gets better, right? Because the new chess game, which they actually called the mad woman's chess game, can you believe that? Like, as soon as the queen got power, they were like, that crazy lady. That's funny. <laughs> but, but the game got better. Yeah. It's much more interesting. There's more beautiful checkmates. It was, it's a little bit faster. So... Um, I talked a little about about that in Chess Bitch as well, and also the individual stories of women coming up in the world and the various hurdles that they dealt with and in different countries and different backgrounds, how that experience was different. Because in chess, it's not just about getting women into the game. It's also about getting all different types of women into the game and making sure that we're reaching out to people who wouldn't normally get the benefits of chess but could perhaps earn the most from it. Um, the other book, Play Like a Girl, is kind of like a prequel to Chess Bitch because it was something for the little girls who maybe their parents wouldn't want to buy them that book. And this is more of like a training manual where it takes the top um, grandmasters who are women in the world and we look at their checkmates and their tactics and you have to solve them. No real difference between a checkmate from a man and a woman but it's also, I think, very powerful to know that every checkmate you're solving in that book is from a female player. As a starting, as an entryway into chess, what would you recommend for a grown-up who wants to get in on chess? Maybe they never played at all, but they're really interested in it. What is the entryway for that? How can they start? 
Well, if you live in St. Louis, you're extremely lucky because we have lots of pure beginner classes. In particular, we have Ladies' Night, Ladies' Night with a K, for women who want to have a glass of wine and some cheese and just learn the total basics, as well as slightly more advanced levels. If you are listening to this and you can't get to St. Louis that easily or the club, you can also learn online. There are a lot of resources to learn online, and that's a good way to get started. I especially feel like for some adults, unlike children, um, for better or worse, adults sometimes get embarrassed when they're really bad at something. And the beauty of playing online is that you can kind of get the absolute kinks out, know that you at least know how to move the pieces, and then go to that more visceral and very satisfying experience of playing um, in the flesh. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. See you at Ladies' Night. That was world chess champion and commentator Jennifer Shahadi talking to Holly Edgel. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.